You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I've done 24 years now. Yeah, because I went back for four, so it's 18 and a half months just done there in the last three and a bit years. I found this recall as hard as the bleeding life sentence. That's how bad I felt it. I really felt it. Triple category A, you're checked every 20 minutes in your cell. You're spun twice, well, move cells twice a month. They shouldn't have used, they said I gripped a gun in a bag and that the, that gun was a Mossberg pump action and the deceased was killed with a Mossberg pump action. It's all absolute bollocks, to be quite blunt. What are you thinking when someone's put a hat out on you in prison? I hope it's, <laughs> I'd have given them a few quid. I was a bit pissed off because it went, it's 50 grand. Then went up to 100, then went up to two. I'll take him for a ride, and I'll take him somewhere very dark, okay, and I'll tape him up, spread eagle him to a tree, read him his life history very quickly. Boom, we're on. We're on. Yes, Jace. Kev. Good to have you back, brother. Good to be back. First one, massive views, massive story. Miscarried of Justice. You've got your book fitted up, which we'll plug straight away. You can get this on Amazon. Um, great book. Like, Thank you. I've read it twice. <laughs> yeah, because it's, yeah, cause it's uh, powerful. And uh, obviously your story as well. Like, even as your youth growing up, you know yourself, you weren't clean cut. You weren't a fucking little angel, but you were involved and a case where you get oh, guilty. I was the angel of some people's eye. <laughs> <laughs> you got a, a, a guilty for a murder that you didn't commit. You've got the book out fitted up. Like, but you end up in prison again. Just a few months back. Like, what happened? So I got recalled. I had uh, problems with probation. I moved. And uh, they kept moving me to different probation offices. Offices I'd drive an hour away like to. You know, in, on the motorway, on the car, like down in Gravesend. And... Um, you know, cut a long story short, uh, I didn't see eye to eye with the probation officer. But bearing in mind, I'd had multiple probation officers, not a single problem. And I've been out bleeding years now, okay? Hardly reporting, staying where I want, and so on and so forth. And she come up with a load of problems about, um, I got arrested for common assault against my girlfriend at the time. And as a result of that, she wanted to know names and everything of the girls I was dating. I said, but my case, I'm not a sex offender, blah, blah, blah. And I objected. And I objected to the area manager. But I said, no problem. So I was single and I was, I was just enjoying myself and being honest and dating a lot. So the prime example of us not getting on, which will lead to what I'm going to tell you in a minute, is that she said, well, give me the... I said, okay. And he said, well, who have you slept with this month? And I said, okay, I'll... And I reeled out a load of names, right? And she tore it up. She said, we'll start again next month. <laughs> I don't mean that bragging, but it'd been a very busy month. And I was very lucky that month. But that's what I had to deal with. And I thought, well, that's an invasion on, the, on, on whoever I'm dating or seeing or have been with that, in that month. They're in, privacy, they're in privacy. So I started falling out of them then. And um, she recalled me for the common assault. But I'd been on bail for six months with a business, no contact with the person, no threat, pr severe uh, uh, provocation, so on and so forth. And she recalled me, which I thought was unjust when I'd been up for so long, okay? She could have said, no, you can put you on curfew, you've got to be in, you've got to report once a week. She could have re re merely made my reporting restrictions severe. So then um, I, got, I got recalled, I went to prison for that, and I got out, I had a tag. And the tag was 40, they said it was 40. Didn't fit it for two and a half days and I was out. So, so much for bleeding, needing me on tag. And the tag obviously reports where you are, doesn't it? So it, it reported that I went into Hertfordshire for three occasions. I said, but we haven't. For one, their middle sex addresses with the bank, the council and so on and so forth. Still recalled me, kept me in four months. Four bloody months of my life again. How, could they have kept, how long could they have kept you in for? <laughs> Look at COVID, 14 and a half months I did. I was sentenced to two months in prison. All right, and I, oh, was that, no, re, yeah, uh, and I got, I did 14 and a half months for common assault. 
Come on, shout you common assault. I'll kiss you, it might be sexual assault. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a, a license hanging over your a life license? Yeah, I've still got a life license. And that, that dictates where I go. I mean, taken off the aeroplane by bleeding police and shite like that on the tarmac. Um, searched on and off the planes, taken aside really badly. And I've complained about that to customs and to my probation officer, but he can't do nothing about it. But nonetheless, it's embarrassing when that happens. Um, but the, the convictions... My barrister became a judge, Joel Benathan, so I had to hand over to another barrister to find one. And I'm now talking to Dominic D'Souza, who we wanted to do a, a podcast with you and discuss the legalities of uh, stuff that's mentioned in my book and things that happened uh, in relation to my co d at the time being acquitted by the judge and conversations and such that went on with him in the police. So we want to go live on that and then build some momentum and go we go on Twitter and the legal professions because obviously Dominic's a leading QC and see what the legal profession have to say about what we have to have said in my book and then we're going to mount the appeal with off the back of the Panorama program uh, Last Chance for Justice um, with Mark Daly um, and Tracy Alexandra they conducted some and Louise Shortier they conducted some tests and said that it was wrong what the police said and they should never have said it. So we're going back to court or criminal case review commission on that. How long have you been in prison? All in? Uh, I've done 24 years now. Yeah, because I went back for four, so there's 18 and a half months just done there in the last three and a bit years. What's the longest you've been out, Kev? Uh, longest I was out was, I, I come out um, January the 15th, 2015 and I got recalled February the 6th 2019 so four and a half years see every, four and years. See every time you go back does it get harder or do, you, do you just become immune to it it was uh, the second time when I got recalled so that was difficult because I knew it was unjust and there's far worse people who should be recalled for what happened that evening I don't think I should have been a even charged. I think that the other person should have been charged with criminal damage to my vehicle and such and provocation taken into account and the condition of that person on the evening. I was sober. But so I went back and I my business and then COVID, I had to sell my car, I had a nice Range Rover, fully loaded sport. Uh, that hurt because I'd always wanted one. And then your funding, you've got responsibilities for children or wages in the office, rents. So the car went, I lost 10 grand on that. The business obviously stopped. So I've had to come out, start a new business again, um, which is, you know, I could, I'd rather have had the four and a half years behind me in the business that I was doing than having to set another one up. How hard has that been in prison for a crime you didn't do? Like your whole life you've been fighting to overturn this conviction. Like how hard does that? I found this recall as hard as the bleeding life sentence. That's how bad I felt it. I really felt it, I have to tell you. And tr trying to do bird, when you're doing bird, I, I got my head around it very quickly. And I said, well, this is my life. I've got, I live here now, this is my home. So I've got to make it the best I can. And that's what I did. And uh, it was frustrating with the obstacles that are put in your path for obtaining information, contacting people, people replying to you via your letters. I used to do, I do some letters 20 a day because I had a laptop in there and, that, and just file the letters out, change the heading, change the structure of it depending on what department or certain issues in there. And that takes time. And then nice to get that out. So you meet a lot of obstacles like that. You're, you're stonewalled all the time. Do you think you can be your own worst enemy sometimes though? For being stubborn? Yeah. No, I think stubbornness got me through. If I hadn't been so stubborn and had the fight in me, I'd have given in, because believe me, I can understand why people take their lives in prison. They just get worn down, constant drip wears the stone. And people suffering there emotionally, heartache, losses, relationship splits, injustices, just, just terrible 
some of the sentences that people get for the crimes that when you look into the, the, the details and how they the police say put these cases forward so you suffer a lot in there a lot of suffering and i i, I gotta tell you it was uh for me there's times when if i weren't so stubborn and strong i would have turned the drugs and when a lesser man i want to come out the man i am did you ever contemplate suicide yeah yeah i did i was fucking frightened the life out of them once i said i'll fucking show you lot all right and when i got a load of tablets and took them i told them i said i'll show you lot took the tablets i was in the special secure unit at the time triple category a and for all those people that say there isn't triple category no such thing honestly there is just look it up on the government websites it exists and most people there's a lot of people in england who know it exists so i was in there at the time and it just opened after the escape i was just split up with my fucking old woman i was fighting with a mufti and all sorts like that and i thought yeah you've banged me up here this is a prime example of what you're talking to it's relevant so when you say, oh, I fucking, mine was anger. Like, yeah, you've put me in here. It's a miscarriage of justice. So I'll bring attention to this miscarriage of justice, all right? Wallop. With like Wayne Owen, a pal of mine, he's dead now. And uh, I love Wayne the bits, right? God rest his soul. I don't believe in God, but whoever's listening, right? He's a proper fellow, Wayne. And uh, he used to get loads of medication. I said, you got right, fucking save some tablets up. <laughs> <laughs> and what he did was, right, I took the tablets, he said, you took them, sleepers and 35 and a din, I think, and a load of sleepers, but eight sleepers, well, a lot to kill, the kill, I don't think, but anyway, went beyond my door, he's come to my door and he's gone, you took him tablets, aren't you? I took them. Fuck it, right? So we had a coup, right? This was a coup, right? I said, well, I'll take the tablets and we're going to frighten the life out of these fuckers now because I'm going to go over, aren't I? So, so let me let me after an hour behind my door or something. Get on the door and so I think he's taking a load of tablets, right? And he did it, right? It frightened the life out of him. He had to go to the Home Office Secretary, Secretary of State, and all sorts. I remember the governor, he came to me, Brody Clark, he got done with the po the passport scandal with Theresa May. I like Brody Clark, gentleman. I found him very respectful. And he says to me, when I've been in there for a while, he said, Kevin, he said, just hold it down a bit longer, he goes, because uh, you've got your cut A coming up, your review, your triple A. And uh, he said, they can't build any more units and they can't send you anywhere. He said, they couldn't handle what I was like in there. Because it was just, when it kicked off, they had to shut down the whole prison. The whole prison. Everyone behind your door, if you're on a phone call, you're going on a visit, because I'm open now, open. So we kick off, kick off at times when they're doing stuff. It calls mayhem. Um, Digress to be there. Maybe that's why you were all fucking triple A then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, it got me off the fucking out the unit. I'm telling you, because it had bad press. It said it was inhumane, uh, sanctions, not sanctions, but said um, who was it who did it? I can't remember who it was now, but it was said it was inhumane. The Guardian reported on it at the Times. Uh, the, the prison home office minister, the, the senior medical officer. He he wrote about it so they didn't need any bad press but you know i took tablets then um well that's the only time i've done it and i haven't thought about taking my life i've been often thought is this what is, is this what i'm living for to have the the constant heartache or trauma or the when i went up for the the ccrc and i was told that I had it in writing that if they didn't think there was some prospect of referring my case, they'd have shut it by now. 21 days later, they, sh they shut the case, all right? And they are blows. When the copper gets nicked in your case and he's been involved in your case right away through it and all the other stuff, and you think, well, fucking hell, like, one case has been squashed, go have a look at mine. Bang, right hander, knock back. Bang, right hander, knock back again and then again. You think, what have you got to do? Yeah, that must, to take. yeah, the hard thing is just getting knocked back, rejection, knocked back, rejection. <laughs> yeah. Is that when it comes to the mental state where you think, what's the point? I could die in here. Definitely so. But what I used to hold on to was the Birmingham 4, the Bridge, uh, Bridgewater 5, Bridgewater 3. Um, was it Bridgewater 3 or 5? I, I knew 3. Yeah, you had Brian Rodman. No, I met him. He got let out on the landing, the fella, the Bridgewater 3. But you got the Guildford 4 and all those lot. And... They had like five appeals, some of them, before they finally got let out. And they're um, grave miscarriages of justice. Hmm. And th that's what I hold on to. I think, well, look, eventually it's a process where I've just got to keep wearing them down, wearing them down, keep 
getting the information out there for people to consider. Uh, and then eventually get the right hander, which the panorama is the right hander for me now. It's a game changer, what Nolvan, uh, Joel Van Nathan said. What was the triple catty like? What sort of prisoners were in there? The, I got different. You, I was in there, I can't mention their names, but uh, I can. Uh, Matthew Williams was in there with me and he escaped out of Parkhurst. Very clever kid. He could. He threatened to poison um, Manchester City Council when he impregnated a fly in, which would poison the water system. He got seven life sentences for that. He sent a letter bomb to a couple of kids who mugged him at uh, college or your, your college. You know, but it's a straight go, and he just well, I'll fucking show you. He used his brain, but he's now a fame. He's a artist doing really well. Um, he was in there. Wayne Holman was in there. There was a fellow in there that uh, he's dead now. He's no longer there. He wasn't a very uh, nice character at all. He was an informer, recognised informer. I knocked him spark out the day I landed there. Put him asleep for five minutes. Yeah. I don't know, I leant over him and said, no, I'm going to I told him anything. <laughs> <laughs> that set that record straight. But, so, yeah, I was alive while my first day into the unit. But it's triple category A. You're checked every 20 minutes in the cell. And you're spun twice, well, move cells twice a month. You put in a sterile cell and they pack all your kit and then put your cell in there, in the cell that you're going to be in. Um, and that's without the other searches that go on, the security searches. It's very, very intense. Focus like, a, like I've said it before, a Nazi camp. You looked at there'd be a screen over there and behind there'd be psychologists writing notes on you, monitoring you. In the strip cell that I used to spend a lot of time in, they call it the box. And I've said this, there was a parapet wall where they could, people could walk around and observe you while you're in there. So it's a very, very severe security. Yeah, it sounds like torture though. Like even if you were, See, even for people who were guilty, even that being in there alone would fuck them up up here. Do you know what I mean? Never mind fighting for your freedom, knowing you're in there, something you didn't do, but you're in there getting tortured, basically. Strip sets, chain cells. Spots. Your mail not going out. Your mail going missing all the time. I had to send every single letter I had to post out in the end, recorded delivery. One pound saying it used to cost me a letter, depending on the parcel A4 or if I send out f f folders and such. And, DVDs of news bulletins and all stuff like that comes to a lot of money. And if you're not getting out and you're posting them, all right, that's a, and then I used to involve the post office, but it's a constant battle where you've got to communicate to the post office by letter again mm -hmm. and wait for responses. And it's just a long, very drawn out system that there's security, security, security. It's run by security. It's not run by a governor. Security is the gov they rule the governor. Simple as that. What was the mufti like? Because I know people. They, some people say they kill people. They came in with the riot gear, balaclavas. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so John Sayers, he was next to me in the unit, okay? Mm -hmm. John won't mind me mentioning his name. And they're making a film about John and the family. Um, I think they've made it with, with uh, Steve Rafe, haven't they? But either way, sorry about that. So he was next to me and... The muff did come in on me. Uh, what did they come in for me now? I'm not sure if it's a time where I got on the bell and told them to go and get kitted up. No, I said to them, two boxes in the ring. I said, when two boxes in the ring, the bell goes off. He went, yeah, I said, two box. the bell's just gone off, go and get kitted up. So they've gone off and I had a tear up with them. And they're dressed in all black, right kit and their bloody, like the body armour and the boots and the helmets and the shields and that, and gloves and get this, they get the coshes out. And they come in and on the cell many a times like that, and you're just trading with them. But the idea is, is to get you into a corner by using force, by, they come in, don't they? But I had, a, I knocked the shield man out once, done his jaw and I think all sorts of bits and pieces. And I was quite successful fighting with them. But believe me, I mean, my eyebrow got split, my eye closed, that closed right up. That was a, a cosh. You know, I can't put my arm right back up here because I ripped all my ligaments once when I was getting wrapped up. That was on camera. And then camera got destroyed. That was all in the units. So the violence with the Mufti is... But believe me, I'm proud to say that and any police, prison officer out there that's been involved in that Mufti with me, and I was discussing this the other day, what they had with me is, whereas uh, 
I would tell them to go and get kitted up because I want to fight you because you've taken fucking liberty. Different, big different kettle of fish than, th than them coming in on someone and that person thinking, fucking hell, you know, they might be angry, but they're, they're, they're fighting because they're frightened. Not wanting to get at the mufti. There's a big difference there. And that tells them something, that when that door's opening, I'm coming for you. And I'm fucking going right, to get stuck into you. You better be bleeding ready because you're going to have a good workout. <laughs> better than you've done in the gym. <laughs> were you still getting to use the gym in that, Kevin, train? Because I know you've done boxing for years. Were you, yeah, were you yeah. still getting to do that in AAA? Yeah, they had a gym in there designated area you could go to at certain times. Like you can't stand in this bit here because it's closed off where they serve food. So you step on it. You get nicked if you stand on it again. Shit like that, you know, you fuck off. But that one of the fellas I told you I knocked out there, I don't want to seem like always violent, but you're in an intense place where it's run on violence. You must get that into your head. Everything's do it or we'll wrap you up. Simple as that. There's no negotiation. You don't go to like a prison in Argentina. They do four years training to be a prison officer. We do six or seven weeks here. Completely different, you know. It's, why does it have to be violence? Why do they have to spray pepper in your cell to come and wrap you up when they could just spray a sleeping gas and put you to sleep and you wake up a bit calmer? And, and what's the money in it? It's got to be, I don't know the cost, but either way, the system's all wrong. And um, what did you ask? What were you talking about there? Sorry, I've lost myself there. This fella, so we're in the gym, and I ran a fall out with this fella, the same fella. He wanted to use the waste bar, and I said, listen, you've used it, we want to have a go on it, me and another fella, Wayne Owen, actually. So it happened, and he got belted, and uh, they come running over, like I say. They come sprinting over to the unit, all right? Loads of them. And I thought, you're not wrapping me up today. So I picked up a weight, a 20 key weight, I stood up above my head like that. They came in like the fucking buffalo, hurt, like stampeding. Seen me with this weight above my head. They went like the Keystone Cops to their feet. <laughs> I went, yeah, yeah, you're going to wrap me up, are you? Fucking hell. And I put the weight down, Kevin. Yeah, I put the weight down, but I'm walking. Put the weight down. That was it. Walked to the block. <laughs> but I had to use that method to defend myself. I hadn't hit any of them, so why do they want to wrap me up? Did you ever think when you were getting wrapped up that they could have killed you? Yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. I was told they were going to kill me. He said, oh, we'll kill you. One screw said to me. I went, yeah, take the cuffs off. We'll talk about it. I knocked him spark out, that fucker. When the cuffs come off, but he was threatening me. Actually, big body builder. Was there many people in prison? I know the majority of people say, oh, we're innocent and this, but is there many people you had discussions with that were fitted up? Yeah, Peter O'Toole, fitted up. Who was he? Brummy lad. Uh, He's doing life for murder over here, 33 years. And when he went to Spain for a murder over there, this Code D did, all the, they don't have PII, like secret information. And they'd give it to him. This Cody just went the other way, blamed him for everything as a silent witness. And he's doing the bird for it. And there's people like that, you know? It's just sad. Like things, there's other people, not just the miscarriage of the justice. I mean, there's a good few cases in there, but in a way, but it does happen. I mean, the Criminal Cases Review Commission and the Court of Appeal accept that they make mistakes and there are people in prison, the police accept that. So there is a percentage just by their own mitigation. Mm -hmm. But you see these people just fall to the wayside, just give up in life. Do you see a lot of suicide in there, Kev? Yeah, I have, I've seen some suicides. I was running with a very dear friend of mine the day before he took his life. <clears throat> and I said something was wrong with him and I asked him. He was, he was a very strong character. You know, he had 16 months left and um, that was very sad. But I've seen others as well, others. I've got a friend at the moment called Robbie Highlands. He's just been released from prison before Christmas. He's got one on TikTok, it's on there, right? Fit up and fine back. Have a look, or the Instagram. So he got released from prison. He's riddled with aggressive prostate cancer. One step at a time on a Zimmer frame, slowly. Dumped in hospital. He's got to have an emergency operation. He's had that now, and they're going to give him a prognosis with his cancer. And they cut his tag off him, so that's how early he is. He's just got out of prison like that. They left him in hospital, nothing. No one's visited him, no change of clothes, no toothbrush, nothing. And I drove all the way to Wakefield last week to see him. Bang, come out of London, and I went up there. 
And that's how they leave you. I've seen people die in prison. A brother had all his bowels cut away and they were putting nappies in his cell. Put, sorry, putting his dinner in his cell on the table and shutting the door. And I asked the door to be open. I went, Garrett, you have. It's all shit on the floor. His nappies were shit. He couldn't get out of bed. Food with mould on them. Two weeks he'd been in there. And that's not a word of a lie. I mean, and I ended up caring for him when he died. Lazarus, God rest his soul. Turned to Islam, but he was a loner, real loner. Uh, but he wasn't, um, he was Jamaican. And got that. And he died, and I took care of him. Very sad. And yeah. When do you see people breaking the most? Is it at the start of the sentence, middle, or the end? Because I know a lot of people get out, they've done a big sentence, they do something stupid just to get back in, they become so institutionalised. When did you see the breaks in people start, middle, or end? People always suffer at the beginning if they're new to it. Even if they're not, like when I got recalled, you could see fucking like a lot of times you're just chewing everyone's ears, telling them your story. That's what you see. Um, some of it's to get to get bring some attention to what happened to me because it was such a travesty. I mean, the compensation at the minute we're discussing with the Home Office because they said they've imprisoned me wrongfully. So you've got to try and get that out of some form so it becomes through discussion and letters. But you see a lot of people at the beginning have that frustration or the fucking dread of, my God, I'm banged up and listen where I am in here. And then they get used to the routine and the way of life and they make a few friends and they settle and you see them change. But I see people <clears throat> break. Normally when family things happen, if their old woman leaves them or if the sentences are just far too long, You've got nothing to look forward to. If you have nothing to look forward to, what does it give you to hold on to? Fuck all. How can you look forward to something but if you're doing over 20 years? Like how does people keep going, like you say, without the break, without showing the screws that you're struggling or breaking? Because that's the last thing you want to ever show them. But how does people then get through it? Like, <clears throat> because you'd have seen the strongest people become the weakest and the weakest people you thought he's not making it and become the strongest. Like, what's the main ingredient to then get through something so long? Keep fit. Use the gym. Don't become couch potato sitting in your cell. You're in there enough anyway. Get out. Otherwise, you just become... Oh, you just... Uh, uh, you're, uh, uh, I don't say cell, right? But you're just living in a cell with nothing. TV, smoking, or whatever you want to do. So keep yourself fit. Try to educate yourself. So I got a sports uh, distinction in sports nutrition. It took me four years studying. So a lot of people do degrees. Um, and try to use your time to make it happy in there. What you play an instrument. Find something to do. Because you've got a lot of time to do. So you better find something where you get enjoyment out of, which is good therapy for you. I had a budgie. So I was living with another object, uh, uh, mammal in the cell. That was great company because you interact with them. My budget used to fucking eat when he was eating. It was going, when I was eating, it was going, nice, nice. And when he was eating, he would go, nice, nice too. <laughs> right? So I did it, and I got drunk a lot. I did get drunk a lot. That got me through it. Great parties I used to have. Good parties. Dancing. Thinking you was the absolute bollocks. But I've been drinking my ooch lately. I was on it last night. Whoa. I couldn't stand up. <laughs> I still drink it. I brewed 100 bottles, right, for an evening with Kevin Lane, as you know, right? And people are going nuts for it. Still now. So I've got to do another batch. So I used to drink that. And luckily, the visits and uh, the stubbornness. I'm not going to let you bastards get away with this. So the reality of the situation is that I did bring the, the English government to the negotiating table because they said you're never going to be released in 2010. They should admit your guilt and do the offending behaviour courses. But then there's some paperwork uh, <clears throat> was sent to my solicitor and that was, it caused <clears throat> me to be released and an appeal. Um, Lord Chief Justice Raffi stepped in on my appeal and she shouldn't have done. And she was my prosecutor's friend and was sitting at his, at his hospice when he passed away and they set up the Callisher Trust where trainee bowsers get funding and helped during their training. She stepped in on my appeal. She's never going to overturn it, was she? 
my case was his best case he ever had. So I got turned down on that, and now we've got the CCRC, the Panorama one coming up. How many prisons have you been in, Kev? I can tell you. Forgot? No, I had 18 moves in four years. Um, <clears throat> the first four years. Bouncing me about in and out of the units. Lay down, 28 day lay down. Uh, calm and off period for stuff like that. Strange, really, because I was always, I was calm. I wasn't going there angry. Things had happened in the prisons I was in. I got sent on the 28 day lay down once for using too much force to defend myself. It's two fellas. I thought that was a bit harsh. Spent a bit, of, nearly three weeks in the block for that, and then 28 day lay down, and then came back. Yeah, it's all punishment, as you can see. <clears throat> I don't know, is it character building? I suppose it is in some ways. How can you release that? Is that a stress on your mind every day? The pain, the kind of flashbacks that do you constantly think about that? Even though you're trying to move on with your life, you're trying to create a bigger business now, you're trying to do well, you're, you're everywhere, social media, your book's out, like you're doing positive things, but how hard is it to not to let go of the past? That was something I was very, very bad at in, in terms of just down to a, a, a cursory a, a conversation or something, might say something or a, a look on that. And I think you fucking know, it'd eat in my head and I'd be self talking all the time. So I had years and years of that in prison and the game concentrate with stone and it, it could have gone either way with me. But I think with working on the case, using the brain all the time, instead of being a vegetable watching TV and such in a cell, I didn't have a telly, did I? So I used to work. I feel that it got me through it. The, the uh, I've lost myself again now. Um, yeah, try to forget the past. Yeah, so I stopped holding, holding on to things because I was in prison and I couldn't do nothing. You just got to accept things that are out of your control. And then a number of things happened during me, during my sentence, the loss of a life and things like that. And I think you just become, you're not so sharp and, stubborn in some areas like that you just think is it worth it prison taught me that some things are just not worth the egg you got to let things go get rid of that rucksack and put it up on the shelf and park it up but i had therapy for two years when i came home and i've had it successfully on and off for the years i've been out and i, I think i like it i go there sit and chat to someone and give you different options of looking at things definitely help me do you think that's what's kept you out even though you've been in a couple of times here and there, but you think that's what's kept you it's kind of sane? Yeah, no, I believe it's helped, but recognising that if you hold on to things that are anger-filled, you become a bitter person. And I'm not a bitter person. I like to have fun and have a laugh. Um, so the aggression side of stuff is prison-related, and okay, it's still in me. I accept that. But first and foremost, I like to be happy and not have things going around in my head that causes me to feel stressed or unhappy. So I'll get rid of them and, and I'm pretty good at trying to control them thoughts. Unless, you know, sometimes you can be heavily engulfed in stuff where you're consumed in it, aren't you? Because of whatever's going on, I've had some right uh, road crashes these last few weeks, last two months, more so two weeks ago. Within days, just like bang, 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 bang. You think, fucking how much more can you take? How did you make your prison hooch? So I worked out a system that I thought I used to use demerara sugar and because uh, it didn't have bleach in it. And so I'd kick, get the fruit, fruit juice, kick that off. And I used one cup of that per two litres. I'd dilute that into a bit of hot water so it'd break down quicker and cook better. Um, wouldn't put the restart into the uh, liquid that's... This is hot, but I mean, I put that into the orange juice, into a bucket or bottles, and make sure it was tepid. And then I'd put the restart into that, mix it up, wrap it up, keep it warm constantly as much as you could. I used to take proper care of them. I'd get up in the morning, do them, get them in the sink before the doors open, you've got to get rid of the smell. I was up at half six in the mornings. So six some mornings and all. And then uh, lunch times, early association, for that bang up and again in the evening all night on the pipes so I could cook a brew in four days just burn all the sugar off for a good yeast 
I'll tell you what, that's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've, I've had some people drink that, uh, proper drinkers. And they said, cool, that's good gear, that. Maybe that's what was fucking all your heads in there. <laughs> I remember so I was in Berlin and somebody made his hooch. I've not fucking felt right since, man. I nearly went blind. I, I genuinely, he'd made it with potato skins, I think yeast. But I, I don't think he had a fucking clue what he was doing. No. you got to watch what you're drinking and some of them stuff. But I make a nice drink. I mean, people who buy my drink. So that says itself, and the, the drink, it's, it's a warm brandy, warm cognac. It goes sweet, but you've got the sweetness of the orange juice, and then the shock of the alcohol where it warms your throat, and you go goose pimply. So that's just, and it's got a good body to it. The clarity is clear, and I strain it, and I settle it, and I put finishing ingredients in it and such like that now. And I, I am going to go and look at it at some point about going into production because it's such a strong drink and it's cheap. How have you enjoyed like, all the attention kind of with your book out and all the, the podcasts you've done, even the podcast you've done with me, very popular, but how have you enjoying that, especially if you've been in prison for so long and, <clears throat> and then, because it's a weird energy now with social media and attention, like, how have you handled that? I've done quite a bit of filming. Um, I'm actually talking again now to someone who's a script writer, we just talked about the book. But it's, that's happened a few times with production companies and such, and I'm still in talking to them. So the filming side of it is really good. I enjoy it. First and foremost, I actually enjoy the company of the production teams. I find that when I go there, it's quite exciting. The topics are uh, good. I enjoy doing them. Um, and I come away from it and just stay focused on my work because this can come and go tomorrow. So I enjoy it as like a night out, and that is it. Um, and hopefully it brings awareness to my wrongful conviction at the same time. And then if anything else comes with it, then great. It's just an, it's nice to be able to do it at this stage of my life from where I've come from, to be able to afford that opportunity to do so. So I was locked up with an MP <clears throat> recently <clears throat> in prison, in an old prison, uh, in Shrewsbury prison. Victoria prison that's coming out that's been commissioned for a series but it's stuff that's going to be shown on there that's going to just I'll say it's saying anything anyway right but I've really enjoyed that inside but I was locked up again but the company was really good the, the person I was with the fellow I was with is a serving MP and uh, it's quite unique so that side of it, things I really enjoy. But I've been in some situations where something happened at another documentary company I was with, and they said something about, well, look, something got on. I said, well, I'm not bothered about the film. So I'll just leave. I'm all right, thank you. I said, appreciate it, but I'll just leave. And they said, oh, no, no, that's okay. That's okay, it's all right. And it was something simple, a request that I had a friend with me, Kenny Collins, Hatton Garden. He came with me. He just goes to a lot of places with me. But they didn't want no guests to be brought or, or be able to wait and it was in Mayfair in a 10 million pound house I said well he's 82 I'll, I'll go with him then they said no and then he stayed so in the same breath it hasn't got well I would do anything and chase it like that I enjoy what I do the people that are filming me at the minute saying it's great filming so they're very happy with it and may it continue and some good come of it for myself and a lot of other people yeah good on you let's talk about your case Kev that is a any chance it's going to go in your favour and everything get overturned and get your... Yeah, they, they, they used some evidence that they shouldn't have used. They said I gripped a gun in a bag and that there is, that gun was a Mossberg pump action and the deceased was killed with a Mossberg pump action. It's all absolute bollocks, to be quite blunt. And Tracy Alexandra for City of Westminster Police conducted that review for Mark Daly of Panorama and Louise Shortier of The Innocent Project and found it to be absolute rubbish is what they said. Now, if you imagine if you were in a jury and you've been told that I've gripped a gun, blah, 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 and there's been forensic residue found in there that's had a used gun or ammunition in there, it's quite damning, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's why I got found guilty, as well as a wealth of other material in that book. And there's no black order on that book, and um, stuff in it has never been asked to be taken out or any issues legally from police or the people that have mentioned in there because it's all factual. And the people that do read it, and I'm talking about right across the board here, whether they be politicians, journalists and such, they just say, how can this country still 
have such travesties where people are corrupt and the systems are being bent in order to get to satisfy it's the canteen culture isn't it um you've got the cps you've got the criminal justice system they're all in it together the police uh they've you know it is a canteen culture mm -hmm. and that book highlights it and it embarrasses them really in, the, in today's society they can still get away of sending you to prison for something you haven't done there was two years charged is that correct and one got out yeah one got out he's now back in for another con uh, contract killing and that person i've been spoken about because they've been complaining about saying i'm endangering their lives <clears throat> well the book's out all right by mentioning them on there and things like that but those people are flying through the system really are getting everything you could ever want um but once i go up for my appeal we'll be asking questions about confidential chats that took place in a number of prisons and information that was given that was used against me by my co-defendant that was kept without my knowledge so there's going to be a lot of questions asked about that and this is why we want to do the a podcast with you of dominic de souza yeah, anything and i think that'd be really good and we discuss the legalities of that and uh, other issues that are right to the, the point and it's factual because it's documented so mm -hmm. um doing a podcast with you and dominic and then making our application to uh the ccrc as well as I'm actually talking to them about uh, a documentary. So I have a collaboration with myself and another documentary company, or one about me. Um, and it'll be the book. Because I've been told that the book is a great skeleton for a documentary or film by many a people. So if I, was, if I do do uh, a documentary on that, it'll be like Barry George or the Guildford Four and stuff like that, where the documentaries go out there. And then it's right in the public eye and that there's people are asking questions now right across the nation and it's they're almost corralled into a go out for a pill and it's in the public domain what's taking place so don't just brush it under the table because the public are watching you now and i feel that will <clears throat> regardless of the panorama program i think it's not regardless but regardless of the documentaries and that the panorama program is so powerful and it's been proven that they shouldn't have used the evidence so that alone should squash my conviction and in the meantime i'll do the documentaries in support of that barry george was that joel dandel guy yeah a poor bastard man another particle fucking one particle got him guilty yeah have you spoke to him yeah i used to see him down the church he was a bit of you know he's a fucking photograph birds and things like that didn't he and that but I should talk to him and he, he's slow but he knows what he's talking about to quite a large degree because he's discussing the forensic issues with me i was talking to him about who he was using and uh stuff to do with the police investigation and stuff that you know we had common interest there but he always sat on his own which was only for me because i wouldn't have gone and sat with the fucking nonces who used to come down there at church as well wankers I used to uh, sit with him and have a chat with him, but not sit with him whole service, go and sit with him at the end and have a chat with him in the tea room and that. But just talk to him. Amazing. You, you, it's a network of people, isn't it, that have got information you know, in relation to the criminal justice system. Yeah, somebody always knows something that you don't, do you know what I mean? Like, so, see, because he was in for killing a woman, was he not getting terrorised in there? No, people thought he was a miscarriage of justice. So there's some people in there that get terrorised, but that pertains to the crimes they're in there for. What was it like being in with sex cases and that? Like? Fucking, I weren't in with any of them. No, but in church and that, when they were down, because I used to work in the gym in Berlin, and they, used to, they were always down. I think it was E-Hole. They used to come down first thing in the morning. I had to give them fucking shots. And yeah. It's fucking horrible, I'd gym orderly myself like you, yeah. and I used to growl at them. Fucking wankers. I hit some ones. But they were so rapists. well protected in there. I'll tell you something about uh, paedophiles and such. They stick together. 
There was two rapists. There was about 18 and a half stone, 20 stone, these two fellas. And they raped three 14-year-old girls and left them for dead, all right? Anyway, I was Jim Orley and uh, had a row of them in the showers, these two fellas. I was a bit volatile then. And other paedophiles come running to their aid. They all got stuck in. I'll tell you what, I was a bit lucky that day. <laughs> but it taught me something then. Christ, they, they stick together that lot. Hated it. Like, just couldn't bear being around them and being in there fucking, you know, they come and use the gym. But in Franklin was good because they had their own gym. We didn't have to mix with them. They had their own gym orderlies. Mm. That's what they started doing. But in Rye Hill and places like that, I was gym orderly and you had to start mixing with them. But I was going through the system then, so... Um, yeah, I just blinkers. Um, but it's a vibe, it's a cold, you know, what I think it's like a cold, airy vibe with them. All the old men, like the beers, they kind of had the, you just look at them and they look fucking weird. Yeah, like, they are. They, they prey on the, the weak, the vulnerable. People are far weaker and vulnerable than them. And they're doing the most disgusting things to them. What does that say about the mindset? Yeah, it's gone. And they wanted to do integration with us and them in the Wise magazine in Whitemore and other prisons. And it was trying to integrate us. It cuts down on costs to visit rooms, movements all the time, more screws, all things like that. And no one had it. I said, I'm not having no paedophile living next door to me. And I, uh, you put my letters on my bed and then he comes in, looks at the pictures and said, oh, nice pictures. And then your letters go missing and you find out he's a fucking rapist stalker or, you know, Pete and Tom or something, whatever. So it's not, it's not right. And I, I might have said, I told you, I think, maybe before, but in conversation, I went to a concert and I was invited there. I thought, strange, there's no tickets. And the vicar gave me a ticket. So I thought, I'll come. It's nice of him. And the psychologist come and asked me what I thought about integration. And I told her what I just told you. And I sat down at this bleeding concert. It was packed in the church. I looked around. I'm sitting with some people, well-known people. Prison, done big time. And I looked up at the fucking band, and one of them was involved in torturing war veterans across Europe for their savings. Polish war veterans, he was Polish, getting into them, wrapping them up with his gang of fellas. And I chased him off the wing. He landed next door to me, and I said, you fucking better be off this wing when this door opens, mate, or you're going to get it. And uh, <clears throat> he went. But I looked up, and he was the only one that, that uh, you could have, it didn't look weird you know the others look weird paedophile weird so we were race relations that's what that was race relations they called that concert i stood, stood up <clears throat> i said this is bacon relations and we should be bashing them not clapping them and i'm leaving the guy's going get him out get him out i said i'm fucking leaving don't worry about that went so yeah i don't think it'll work you'll have more deaths they haven't had five deaths in uh, 2011 in high security estate, people being killed. God knows what will happen if you start mixing paedophiles. Look at Grendon, I've only had two down there in the last 10 or 15 years. It must be hard for people to go to Grendon because no Razor Smith's a good friend of mine's and notorious bank robber went to Grendon, changed his life. But they're sitting in a room, circle full of fucking nonsense, and they've got to share stories. Like, it must be hard for people to really try to change their life to then bite their lip to not attack them. Terry Ellis's book, Doing Bird Time with the Beasts, I always wondered what they go for over there. And I've got pals who've done time in there, right? But I've never discussed it with them. And then Terry articulately sets out the shit you've got to put up with. If you're showing them offence, you can be chucked out of there. Hostile, you've got to sit and talk to them. And if you don't sit and talk to them, that goes against you and it's a marker. So they're forcing you to sit with people who have done the most despicable, disgusting crimes to children and women and all sorts of other people. And you've got to talk to that people and not show that you are disgusted with him. Well, what are they saying then? You've got to act and be full. But you shouldn't have to act and be full, should you? You should be transparent and honest. I say, I don't like you. He's a fucking predator, a beast. And I don't agree with what he does, but you're saying I've got to agree with what he does and be nice to him. Well, you wouldn't be nice to him outside of here. I'm sure you wouldn't. 
And that's what they're forcing people to do. I think it's disgusting. That, that tortures you when you come home. Like my pal was in, he said, Kevin, fucking honestly, seven years my mate was in there, all right? Seven years. And he says, Kevin, I can tell you the things that go through my head with the stories I've had to listen to. Yeah. But I think that would do more damage to someone listening to those horror stories and seeing how bad and evil the world is. Even though some of them have robbed banks and killed people, but to be sitting here then, anybody that has kids or loves kids mm -hmm. like, knows how hard that is to even fucking fathom what goes through their mind, what they do. Do you know what I mean? So oh. To never mind see it in real life, what they've actually done, so have to sit there and accept that. <laughs> Oh. That's difficult, but that how can you? I, that's why I've always questioned people who went to Grendon as well. But I've never, I can't understand how they can. I know they're trying to change it, and tr I get that, but I still can't justify how if somebody's talking about killing kids and raping kids and doing all the mad shit that they've done, like serial fucking predators, and they have to sit there and as if to say, ah, oh, not well done, but just it's fucking. It's just I, I can't understand that. They have to sit there and talk to them about their crimes and try and find rationale of it. Really? Rationale? Well, not right, so much rationale, but a reason why they did it, the problem behind it, all right? Now, you're just fucked in the head. What you do is not right. You do not function like we function because that it can't be right what you do to, to some of these kids and stuff that goes on. It, it, I'm lost with that. I mean, it's, just, it's not right. And uh, I just, I've been in that gaff. They stuck me in Gwendon when I had a minor occurrence in Spring Hill when I was in there as a DCAT, finishing off a sentence for kidnapping. <laughs> as you do. I was oh, well, you know, it's in the book anyway. To be fair. All right. And uh, a screw was on the, uh, under investigation in there and it threatened me. He said, I'll punch your fucking face in. And I said, Are you talking to me? He went, Yeah. So I went, I'll put my dinner down. I'll give my fucking bang left. Fucking bang right, crack, I've gone. And uh, grabbed his head and put it in the fucking, in the soup. <laughs> the curry, it was a curry, went wallop. Right, and then jumped up on the thing. Anyway, I got sent over to Grendon, and you're talking about the people in there. Those blokes in there were like one tooth, dribbling, and they had like a little uh, uh, Alcatraz prison. That's what it made me feel like in there, dark, Cells, dark lighting, and they've got their faces at the, the, the doors. Yeah, and that's where they put me for the night in there, and then stuck me back under cell confinement after that. But I see some of the people, well, these people ain't here on treatment. These are being contained or pr in prison, they've been, they've been held here because they're mentally unstable. Why was the informant in AAA? Why was he not in protection? Because he tried to escape out of Durham prison with. Uh, Davy Fields, they smuggled a Derringer gun into prison and he he informed on Davy that he had the gun. They was in the block and they searched Davy three times and they didn't, the third time they found it on him. He had it up his rectum and fucking strapped with bollocks to put, they put a mirror on it. Anyway, uh, his escape classification meant he had to go in there, gun, smuggled into prison. But he got, he got a deal. But he did other things where he handed keys to, he was a block cleaner. Years ago, if he was a block cleaner, he was definitely no good. Because there was always the other people doing it, paedophiles and grasses and such. Um, and my pal gave him a set of keys and a marvel tin sealed. He said, there's a set of firings in there. He had no option, right? He'd be in the block, he got caught on the fence in Long Lart and the ladder broke. And he had the keys. So he said, give this canteen to such and such with a cunt when and give it back to, excuse my French there. You won't hear me say that very often. I apologise to any ladies are listening, but um, he went to give the keys to his handler, which was a, P a PO, a principal officer. Handed the keys over. Yeah, so he's, he was working his ticket all the way through. And every unit needs a grass. Get information out of people, get close to them, They're talking about their cases and that. Fellow in my book's done that, exactly that. You now people have cut him off. He's just going, like a great pace of knots in the system. And I was told by the RA boys, he said, every unit's got, got a grass, Kevin, now anyway, after the escape. Is that just kind of, if you're in there for a long time, getting to know somebody, befriending somebody, and you kind of tell them things that you shouldn't? 
and they report it back. That's what people do. But uh, if anybody ever questioned me, I used to go into the principal's office and say, I want it written down that I've been asked something about my case. I want it on record. To protect yourself? Yep. Yep, straight away. Or I tell my solicitor straight away. You must have been a miss of mad bastards, Kev. Like who's who's let you think to yourself, he's a, he could turn it any minute? Dave Beaver. Who was he? He's nuts. <laughs> but he must have said that about you as well. <laughs> uh, no. He's just been done. I think he just he tried to cut a woman's screws head off in Long Line. He shot the police officers in Leeds, didn't he? He was a Yank. He's American, David is. And uh, I got on with him. I mean, he was, he was asked to fucking kill me. Um, he was offered a few quid and he come and told me. And then he said, Look, I like it, Kevin. He said, You're a nice bloke. I said, Fuck, thank you very much. He is the one dangerous bastard. Like, he looks at you, and when he's looking at you, you just know he's, he's thinking things that, you know, you wish you weren't thinking. <laughs> but he was dangerous, him. Him, and then Warren Slaney, very dangerous individual. Who is he? He's a uh, miscarriage of justice, got fed up by his co defendant. He's done 30 odd years now. He's like Charlie Bronson type. Um, but he gets things in his head and very, very, and he will be very violent. And I feel for him because the system's done that to him. The system would have done that to me. See, what happened was if you were rebel or you stand up and fight the system like I did, if I'd have been on the mainstream prison system, I'd have gone into the mainstream blocks and been, there'd have been a reception committee waiting for me because I've just had an altercation with a member of staff or Mufti, whatever. I've caused some damage to them. So I would get some damage down in the block. But then that means then I would come back at them because that's where I am. And then I would have gone around the prison system from block to block to block, like the Warren Slaney's, Charlie Bronson's and many more people and become a product of the system because they were using violence in the first instance that caused the violence. Because I was in the special secure unit, I had to go into the block unit in the unit because it was contained in the wall with its own fences, wasn't it? That means I had to see the same staff because the staff had to be clear to work in the unit. So it'd always be the same staff, unless it, the alarm bell went off and they had to come over for that reason. And I said, any of you take any liberties with me, I'm going to get, first one I can get, I'm going to get, as soon as I get a chance. So there was no more violence. I didn't come back at my violence because I hadn't done anything further to what we just had the row over. Otherwise, I would have been the same as them, I believe. What are you thinking when someone's put a hat out on you in prison? I hope it's... <laughs> I would give them a few quid. I was a bit pissed off because it went... It's 50 grand, then it went up to 100, then it went up to two. And that was to, then it's been like to maim me, put a blade in my eye or oil me and then, then kill me. Uh, but I walked them landings, the same landings, in the same place for years after. Like people, three people come and told me they was asked to kill me. And we, this has been a discussion recently on, on Sky News that the police have called for the Osborne warnings to be abolished. Because one, I'm being told, and I'm being told who's asking for it to be done because they want um, me silent um, about what I say, about my book. Um, and that the, the police are saying they waste the resources. I've been having them for years. And now, Wherever I go is publicised. I go to events late in the evening, hundreds a year. I've been to hundreds since I've been out. It's definitely hundreds, thousands, on a couple of thousand, I'd say. Um, publicised when I do my uh, charity work. It'd be easy to kill me. So easy if someone was going to wanted to kill me, because there's so many opportunities for them, and I've been getting these now for twenty years. And the police are saying it could be a case of someone gobbing off, pissed, coked out their head. Also life threats, of course. I don't, I don't discount that at all. But um, Sky News reported on that fact, and it's, I think it's a waste of resources. What I say is this: that the police have to be told first of all that there has been a threat against that person's life, and they've got their sources, haven't they? Police, crime stoppers, formers. So why don't they go and see the person that is issuing these 
hits, especially, for instance, if they was in prison, and saying, right, your progression ain't going through prison because our intelligence shows if you're trying to have someone weighed in and you're already in here for contract killing, by way of example, but they don't. And we're saying it's an absolute waste of time. Is that your character, though, that people have actually been offered money, 50 grand, 100 grand, 200 grand, to take your life, but they've actually come up and told you, look, we've been offered this? Yeah, I think so. I was proud of that, that they said, we like you, Kevin, you're a good bloke. Well, you know, so we don't want any trouble in case you find out that we've been asked to kill you and we ain't come and told you. I thought that was very decent of them all. All right? Because they have, uh, I mean, they've stabbed and done a lot of things to a lot of people, these these three individuals. I mean, tried to cut a prison officer's head off. Come on, for God's sake. So, yeah, my character, I, I, looking back now, I think so, yeah. Oh, I just like to have a good laugh. I mean, a good pal of mine, Noel Cunningham, he's asked a question about me at my evening with Kenny Collins and that, and he said, his wife, his girlfriend, actually, Lee, said, um, what was Kevin like in prison? And she said, every time he stepped out of that cell, he was smiling. It's every day. I mean, because you get the odd occasion where you might pop it, but overall, yeah. And, and I think that's a testament to my character. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison, Kev? The worst thing I've seen in prison? Keys are bent over. Didn't look very clever. It was a fella standing behind him and looked worse. <laughs> you go into a cell and see that, mate. I think that's fucking horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you mean violence, don't you? No, but that is pretty fucking sick, mate. Like, there was a kid, I was only in for a few months, there was a kid in the, as well, they were dubbed up together, and in the mornings we used to ground and get, and collect the, like, the plates or whatever, and uh, and the fucking two cunts were cuddling in the top bunk. Well, I'll tell you, right. It, but that's all yours is obviously worse. Oh, well, I mean, look, the doors will be wedged up when they're at it. <laughs> but fucking... <laughs> I've got gay friends in there that I like, you know, fucking decent fellas. For me, in terms of, done their burger, but I didn't bother that one, all right? And uh, their sexual preferences, and so anyway, I've walked in, and they're fucking at it, banging away. I thought it was fucking disgusting. Oh, it stunk. Smelled of shit. Oh, it's horrible. But I've, I've um, you say the worst things. I mean, look at Lazarus dying. In that cell, I, f I just I don't, that will never leave me. That the violent side of things, of course, is so much of it. It's just where you start. I mean, terrible things. Ears falling off from oil, slashing and stabbing us. Yeah, yeah, I've seen a lot, but mainly the oilings where people get oiled up, and you see just their face change there and then like a Batman film you know just fucking terrible disfigurement and screams I, that I thought God I hope I don't get oiled up I mean so it happens so often down there now in these prisons it used to be hot water but now they make this bleeding napalm boil oil or melt plastic and put batteries in it and sling that in your face. Yeah, it used to be water and sugar though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to look back on my prison system, on my prison time, and think, I seem to be holding on to more when I'm, just, when I'm out and such, and they just come to you with times that I've had. And I said, yesterday I said, oh, I have had some of the funniest times in prison. Christmas. Crying my laughter. Because men, people are very resourceful. And if you think about some of the crimes that people do or the effort they've got to put into getting out, putting it together. Or, so I used to brew oops and I'd nick my mate, uh, Graham Bailey. Uh, Graham was gay, right? But he was a quiet old man, didn't bother no one. I was going to have a drink with him. Fucking nice, right, nice conversation, all right? Cock me. And... Or well, he killed a gay geek, I think he tried, oh, it was something like that anyway. I think it was, but lovely fella. So he used to get me the pipes, the oxygen pipes out of the fish tanks because he used to look after the fish. And I used to put the pipes out of my booze into another bowl 
and then filter it for the smell. Very ingenious. But I've had some great times in prison. You have to make the best of your situation, don't you? What do you think when you see two, were two friends that were shagging in the cell? Yeah, but that goes on so much in there. Like you, people you would know of, but uh, it goes on so much. They have like uh, prison husbands, don't they? Kind of jail gay thing. Jail, yeah, jail thing like that. But if I ever get banged up again for a long time, which I please God hope never happens, when I'm saying please God, I don't believe in him, but figure of speech. I'm going to get myself a pair of tits and I'm going over to women's knee. <laughs> <laughs> you can right. fucking do that now. Fucking right. I want to be a woman and I want to be known as Christine. <laughs> I'm getting over there because there's so many now going over there and they just give you a pill to stop getting an hard on, get a pair of tits and I want to be a woman. And I'm getting over there. Mm -hmm. And I'll be cuddling women. <laughs> blah, 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 be doing that then. Going, I never cuddled a man yet. Though, mm -hmm. like, but I thought I might as well go and cuddle a woman. When does it ever end for you, Kev? Like that's been it is still a mad life. Like for people maybe not seeing the first one, that like watch this first and then come back. Like, like how's it been? Like, what do you think? Like when you, because I, I know you, mate, and I love you, but you're a, you're a mad bastard. I'm not going to lie. Like your your characteristics are you're a mad bastard, but yeah. also a good guy. And you you've always phoned me and says, look, if you ever need anything or whatever, you'd be there in a heartbeat. And I, I don't ever doubt that. But how do you look back in your life and think, fuck me, like what a ride? It's only just beginning, but what I do you think? I said this the other day. It, it, literally, you're hitting on things I've been discussing. I was saying, fucking hell, when I look back over my life, on uh, what I was like. So I dived off of a balcony in a club onto the dance floor. When? No, I was 18. I was, I was working on the doors and they kicked off and there's all loads of people come to the area for a tear up in this disco pub up until 12. Disco club. When the disco started, uh, you know, all the modern music started coming out on uh, the screens and that, you know, MTV and all that, right? But they had a proper DJ for, and it kicked off in there, about 50 fellas fighting, massive pair up, and you couldn't see the dance floor from folks tearing up. So I got a can of CS gas, dived off of the fucking balcony, right? And went into a bang, flattened all these blokes, literally, they were shoulder to shoulder fighting, right? I stood up and just turned around with CS gas, just turning around, spraying it. Got them all out of the club. Gone out. And, I, and that was in the paper. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, like, why did I do that? I, I didn't really need to do that to stop fighting. Might have been a, a long, long winded way. But I used to do dull things like that. And I think I have done things that have maybe put me where I am today in how people receive me. But in the same time, I've had some fantastic times. Oh, a, long, a lot of it spent in prison. But as a young man growing up, being the character I am, and the people that I seem to associate with have mixed me, are all obviously real decent people. And I'm proud of that, real decent people. So I might be a bit crazy, I might be a bit wild, I might like a good time, but very kind, and I mix with kind people. So, so far, the ride I'm on, it happened for a reason. And I went to prison for a reason, and that reason may be now, this is my calling. The TVs and such, and the charity work I do, and obviously my home, uh, my new company, Module Manufacturing Limited, where I've designed a home out of galvanized steel, and I can provide a home, say a two bedroom barn, 44 foot by 21 foot for 125,000 pound, delivered turnkey, beautiful black barn. And I've also taken that house, and I've had a, a, a structure designed, superstructure on wheels to carry it about, to move it if I want, if it isn't built out of foundations. So that gives millions of people options in this country now under what's called portable and temporary accommodation. We can wheel the house in on wheels. I can take the wheels off and lower it down onto a foundation. Again, that's another option. But it's things like that that I'm enjoying now in my life that is another ride. It's been very, very hard and difficult, believe me, like hemorrhaging money, setting it up and stuff like that and things going wrong. But I wouldn't be here now doing this. Would I be doing that if I hadn't gone to prison? Would I be dead if I hadn't gone? So I tried to think on the here and now and the positives and enjoy what I'm doing, even though sometimes it can be a real car crash recently. I mean, it's a very difficult situations down to importation and using a company from Turkey that 
a transport company that was bogus, not bogus, but a bit cowboyish, charging you more than they should have done and wasting 12 and a half grand on transport we could have saved. And then other stuff, learning curves about, I'll give you a prime example. So we had uh, a design this product that came over and we had to wait for my partner in Turkey to come over. Um, his visa was declined. We had to pay £3,000 to get his visas approved because we unwrapping our first homes. Mm -hmm. So you want to be here when we do it. That took three weeks and a, a lot of money. In the meantime, the meadow where the home was, where it was dropped off and delivered, was wrapped in this super tarpaulin, real thick stuff, all the way around it on the roof and everything. And for some reason, they didn't put the, the tin sheet on top protection just to transport it. The birds broke all crows, pecked all holes. All the seniors come through. During Christmas, coming up to Christmas, November, in the snow, we had to get all the walls, rip it all down, take it apart and do it again. And it's come over brand new. So you've had to strip it down the frame and put it all again. That's hard. When you're ill for two weeks, right up till Christmas, the cost you've got to find for that. But although these are the, the problems I've had, the last few days seeing the house is finished and put together, you think all of that is worth it because I've designed a beautiful home that is going to help millions of people out. I've got a little white house, picket house, for instance, one bedroom, 45 square metres squared, £100,000 delivered to your turnkey. Galvan, they're beautiful. And I was in them yesterday, warm, no heating on. And it's blistering outside. We put one heater on, the whole gas warmed up. So would I be doing all of this now if I hadn't gone to prison? Who knows? Will I be doing the TV and that? No, I don't think so. See, because you're free now, can you, even though you're still, can you still enjoy it? Because you know how good it has been for you with the years you've missed? Or do you, are you still bitter? No, I'm not bitter. Well, I got banged up a couple of, uh, with industry to be doing this filming and we're down to bare necessities. Uh, we had no water for the sanitation and such. We only had buckets and no electric for kettle and cold, no eating. It's real grimy cell. Just got on with it and I realised I was pottering about and I uh, wasn't moaning about it. It was just, um, you appreciate things then. And you realise how easily you can revert back to, well, what have I got to do to take care of myself in here now in terms of food, preparation, things I need. Even down to putting coat hangs up on a wall made out of matchsticks. Just get, get on, get on, done with it. Where someone else thinks, fuck, where can I put my coat? Oh, fucking hell, no. That's the problem. It ain't a problem. This is what I'm used to doing. This is the life I lead now. And it made me realise where I've been and where I am now, where I want to get to. I mean, that is the only thing I ever took out of a course is where I am now, where I want to be. Well, fucking, I don't want to be back in prison. I want to be free, leading a good life and doing good with the money that hopefully I'm going to earn for a lot of people as well as provide homes for people that can't get them. Beautiful homes, they're mortgageable, as well if they come out of foundations. Mortgageable house, so I sell your house for 125,000 pound, mortgageable. Go and buy a bit of land, with permission on it, you've got a cheap house. So yeah, I'm really happy with what I'll do a sales pitch there, hey, but. Yeah, good on uh, you, I mean, that's just what it's all about. How can people get involved for them, for people watching this, maybe, do you know what, that sounds good, but how can they get involved? Have a look at the Module Manufacturing Limited website or Instagram page. Um, that's just not finished yet because we're launching this month. But we've got a number of products on there as well as a website in Turkey for homes that we build, massive homes, palatial, no money. Um, and they build out there with, they build in a way that we sh we build in over, we should be building over here putting houses up in no, well they are now in many ways, but I put a house up in seven and a half days. How long do these houses last? They're mortgageable. No, like structure wise, like obviously your houses are built in brick, cement, but like they'll last for well, 100 years, 200 years. Yeah, look around the London, see steel buildings, galvanized steel buildings or steel buildings or bridges and mm -hmm. British rail stuff still standing there over 100 years old. So they won't be mortgaging these if they weren't going to be there for the next generation on after that. Um, that makes me focus, when I do these, when I've done these homes, it makes me focus on what good there is for me left in life still to go forward and do. And that's, that's, that's an enjoyment that I'd like to do. 
if you find something you enjoy, you never have to work another day in your life, do you? Yeah. And the faces, the smiles I see on people's faces when they, they've seen my homes, like, wow. And I'm getting, like, Alfie Bess, he's, uh, he's seen the product and Peter Fury's and so on and so forth. And I've discussed this before. It's taken me a year to do from being released from prison. And I've sold everything. I've borrowed. I've been lent money by my pals. I'm owed money, by the way, by a fellow called uh, Andrew George. Uh, and uh, he owes me £245,000. I was one about to borrow money from a uh, property investment I went into in Turkey. Bought me out. He's now banged up. So that caused me problems when I've got no money for that. And I'm having to go and get money as well. I sold my car. You know, I sold that. So that hurt me. And then I nearly thought about pulling my watch the other month. Seriously. Because the cost was just coming in for um, all sorts of things. But the damage to the property, that hurt us. But for all of that, I'd still rather be out here with those problems than locked up in them shitholes, watching the sadness and depravity going on around the landings and the violence and, and the deceitfulness that goes on in them gaffs. Fucking deceit, backstabbing shit, a lot of it. I'd rather be out here. Yeah, that's problems. the thing. You break it all down, you're still out. Like, you'd rather have these problems than have the problems of being inside. Like, you've got to keep yourself busy, Kev, just to kind of stay focused and not think about the past as much. Uh, I've always been a very busy man. I'm, I, I used to have trouble going to sleep at night, just sitting there thinking, like a lot of people. But I breathe now, do breathing exercises and such. But, um, no, um, no, really, I've just always been a busy person. Uh, it's proactive when you're busy. And you get a lot more done. I like to be busy. In, in, it, being locked up in the cells was hard for me when I first went away because I used to walk back and forward. Cause I, I hadn't worked out a structure of keeping myself busy, apart from working on the case and such, but I didn't have a laptop for the first few years of it. I had an Olivetti one and stuff like that. but. Just getting set up, getting into the routine, routine of prison life. Mm -hmm. With well, your case as well, Kev, okay, would you never just, I know it's hard now because you came so far, but would you ever just forget about it, just to put closure to it, to rest and just concentrate fully on your future? No, never. What that book does, it's not just primarily about my conviction. If you look at it in the whole, that book shows that the criminal justice system is in a fucking state still, and it's still corrupt. And they should be doing something about it. More importantly, why isn't someone from the criminal justice forward come forward and say, actually, looking at the book, we're going to conduct an investigation and we're going to come back here. But they don't. You won't see that in England. They don't like apologising to people where they're, when they're wrong, even when they overturn their convictions. So I'm buggered if I'm going to go away and let them do what they did to, did to me. When I, when I won't, no, I'll never do it. Give, give my conviction overturned, I'll stand on the court of appeal steps and I'll say, I told you so, I'm a free man now. <laughs> All right, let's go to the pub and have a drink and I'm going to get on with my life. <laughs> I had, the system has completely fucked. I had a woman on just yesterday. Was it yesterday, Steph? Yesterday, Sarah Sands, an old man sitting at the shop, 77, ended up befriending and abusing three of her sons. She went round with a blade, killed them. She got three and a half years. The system then doubled her sentence because she said it was too lenient. She nearly got over seven years. It's disgusting. So you go to some countries, they'd see that as a crime of passion, right? Or like Spain, you kill someone, you can pay their family off, give them some readies. You know, they might have killed the husband who's a breadwinner. You have to, you know, they look upon it a bit differently. But that travesty there to that lady, just, I don't think... We're very draconian in England, aren't we? Our laws and such. And ruthless, old. yeah. Ruthless. Mm. I, uh, but so is America, man. Some of them are doing 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. It's fucking nuts. We're going like America, though. Do you not think that? Yeah, and Glasgow used to be 15 years for a murder. Now people are getting 35 wrecks, 40 wrecks. But what they do in Scotland is, if you admit your guilt halfway through or do the offending behaviour courses... Mm -hmm. They progress, start progressing you to go home. Yeah, you get, you get your home leaves and stuff. But they start sending you through the system because they're saying that is, you, you're doing the courses. You don't have to admit your guilt, but you, you're doing the courses. Whereas in England, they say you admit your guilt. I was very lucky where I did the offending behaviour. I did 
certain courses in the end that I didn't have to discuss my faith. We took a judicial review, my solicitor, and won it. So if he reduces his risk to society by in the, pr in the prison, whether it's working in the gym, he's got to be security cleared for that. It's an escape risk if you're in there because you've got, you know, you know all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Go through the wall with a bleeding wage trolley, whatever. I wouldn't, I, I wanted to go to Scotland for that reason and see my family up there and they, they wouldn't hand me over the English authorities said, you're not going to Scotland. You're not going back there. You're staying here to serve your time. Get every day of you here, didn't you? Did you ever think about us, game? Do you know what? I had a way out, okay? <laughs> and I spoke to a pal of mine over the phone the, the other day about it, okay? So I knew it would be useless for me, to, to children, say your kids need your kidney or something in their ear or something. So escape was no option for me. Although they had me in that classification because I would always be tied to my children. And if they need me, I'd be there. That's the sacrifice I made, not escaping, but I could have got out. Yeah. And I had a way to get out. And it was, I told someone, and I told one person in 2011, I'd had it years, when I was being moved out of the prison system into a lower category when I was being downgraded because of this paperwork that my solicitor received. And it was a long area. It's between the workshops. I can tell you about it now because I told this person and I said, I've, look, I'm telling you now. I said, I've told him he's doing a long time. And I thought, well, anyway, fucking hell, within no time at all, mate, that area was shut off. They put helicopter wires. So you had the workshops and from the workshop to the, the walkways when you come down, it, that'd be fenced off, right? And the walkways would be there, all right? And that was wide enough there to get seven and a half ton lorry, get a juggernaut down there. It was that wide. It was about 150, 200 metres long. Michael Light, straight down, straight off. No problem. And I told my pal, I said, look, that's where you can go if you want. Been there for years. They take off. No problem, them things. Just laying down and go off again. Yeah, and the fellow I told, he, he threw it in. Yeah, and now he's going through the system. But my mate, I was discussing it with him the other day. I said, remember that? He went, yeah. I said, yeah. So anyway, I had somewhere and uh, I never looked into it. I just thought that is a way out. Um, and there's no screws there. So and they fly over that. They fucking fly all around the place in the cut, didn't they? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Where do you go with your life now, Kev? I know you're busy with the projects that you're doing, but what's the plans for the future? Porn star. <laughs> <laughs> I can get you into that. I've interviewed I, fucking loads of them. Fucking hell, like. And I ain't cheap. <laughs> so I went to a porn star um, uh, thing. in. Um, it was in uh, Spearmint Rhino in London. Awards. Christmas. The show, Christmas show. Yeah. And then uh, I took my partner from Turkey, who come over, he's Muslim, right? So I got two of the birds, the dancers, and I said, take them out of the back there. I said, take all your clothes off <laughs> and dance for him, right? Fucking hell, like, he didn't know what he hit my partner. He's like, Muslim, Muslim. <laughs> but he was smiling, the biggest grin he had on his face. So um, I don't know what I'm going to do anyway. I'm just going to carry on doing what I'm doing. I want to get these homes out, and I want to... Get the conviction overturned. Uh, continue seeing my uh, myself go forward in a positive way, um, and enjoy life. I love the film to be done about my case, and there's been a lot of talk about that from a lot of people. Um, get the conviction overturned, and then that will get me. That will be a film straight away, regardless. But um, I feel things like it's like a, I'm nerding the bread at the minute. All right, I'm nurturing it or nerding it. What do you do anyway? So we get in there. And I think that it can, it's going to go that way. The business will be successful. I'm, you know, I'm working hard enough for it, you wouldn't believe. The conviction gets squashed. And uh, I just retire to somewhere a little bit more quieter, away from people. And I say that respectably, and that I like to be on my own in terms of I don't like to live in built up areas because I've been surrounded by people for years in big houses like sardines. Uh, and, and they're just, Carry on with my charity work. 
Um, and anything else, and if I've got some money, uh, I wanted to leave something behind in the place where I grew up in Harefield, buy something that can be used by the community, but it can only be used by the community and the profit stays with the community. Uh, something like that, you know, something that benefits the kids. Because I had a youth club when we was in there and I don't think there's so many of them now, but something a bit more modern times where the kids can go there and learn something in terms of a skill or something, you know. So I'd like to do something like that. Please, God, they're all dreams, aren't they? You've got to have dreams, haven't you? Yeah, of course. What's your restrictions you've got in your life, Kev? Can you travel? Or? I can't leave. I can't go to Scotland. Um, I've got a family member up there who's ill at the minute and I can't go there without permission, so I've got to get permission. Um, can't go into Hertfordshire. I can drive through it. Um, if I break down, I've got to call the police and all that stuff. Uh, people abusing my position in terms of a lifer. They dangle that recall, phone the police telling me you threaten me. You just, the fellow that owes me money has just been banged up for fraud, ripping people off, all right? And he owes me money for, like, say, the properties. I can't go around his house and knock on his door aggressively. I've been to his house. He weren't there. I spoke to his wife. I said, you need to know this is what he's doing. I'm owed my money, please. And he's not making any payments. And that's why I'm here, because he's offering payments. He's, but nothing's ever coming. So, But because of my conviction, I can't go around there in a the manner that he could... I'm, I'm glad they had ringtone on the door, which was... That gave me the backup I needed as well. Video it all, what I had to say. You owe me money. But I would rather deal with him in a far more aggressive way when it comes to this, because you, unfortunately, violence will work in place of negotiation here, because this is just a fuck you job, because of my conviction. And the police can't help you. But I maybe have to be a case where I finally go to the police, because he's threatening to have me nicked if I come near him. So what do you do? They're difficult times when you're owed a lot of money. You know, and you need that bloody money. So the, things like that cause me problems. You know, what would people think if I have to go to the police with my case and say, listen, I've got stuff here where the geezer's pulled some strokes, blatantly pulled some strokes. He's now in prison for fraud. He's fucking me. He's not giving me my money back. And he's threatening to have me nicked if I go and see him. What would you do? And I'm, it's two years now and I'm waiting for my money. Is that, and other people's money that he's taken. Is that the hard thing, Kev, when you're trying to go legit, knowing how dangerous you can be and what you've done to then somebody try to pull a fast one on you? I'll take him away, no problem. He'd get straight in my motor in the boot, he'd be in the boot of my car and I'd frighten the life out of him if I didn't hurt him. I'd take him for a ride and I'd take him somewhere very dark, okay, and I'd tape him up spread eagle him to a tree, read him his life history very quickly, in a manner of speaking, that he could be seriously injured. If things, if I wanted them to be, if I was like that anymore, but he would pay me. And I see uh, mafiosos fellas talking about how to get people to pay. He said, you need to have three mean motherfuckers who don't give a fuck and they will come and hurt you, or they will hurt you, or they're going to hurt you, and you will pay. But if you don't have that, people will just go, see you later. So violence does work when it comes to making people pay. And if you use the courts of the land, people haven't got the money to do that, or the police are against them anyway. If I threatened someone, I'd be straight in that police station being questioned. It, it, it's just... To be, be, have someone giving it to me by using the police and then morally for me to go and do that now goes against the grain. But society's changed. Maybe I have to use the tools now that he's using on me. Is he using your life license against you? Yeah. yeah. See, that's the thing. My, my, a good friend of mine, his missus says he had a gun and he had to do another five years. It's recall. disgraceful. You lead my life now, I do. Like worrying about fucking doing this, doing that, don't go there because you, you've got to avoid problems with the police, you don't want to get in any trouble. I won't go to a march in London, peaceful protests, and ended up getting wrapped up by old Bill because I'm being pushed forward into him because I can't go back. You know, protesting, a deal to climate change or something. I can't go there. There's many restrictions over me, my life. How I lead it, who I mix with, 
which is a good thing. Um, cause that has, that imposes a little bit of the puts the brakes on you. I'm not so blasé where I go now or anywhere. Like, um, I wouldn't go somewhere a real rough house. I mean, I ended up in the Satan Slaves Clubhouse in the Black Hills in Dundee. I just went out on my own one night, ended up there. And uh, will I do that now? No, because I'm a little bit uh, calmer now. I think, oh. Before, I would throw, throw caution to win. It was exciting. Yeah, fucking hell, let's get in there. So that keeps me out of a bit of trouble. Did I tell you the thing about the, what the, the, the angel said to me when I was up there? So... I was taking it, as a kid had come out, I started taking him, right? So I've ended up in this clubhouse, they've got speakers as big as a door, and they're broad Scottish accent, you know, and the music, and I can't understand what he's fucking saying. To me, right? <laughs> I can't understand. My cousins were really pissed and stopped talking, right? So I look like, <clears throat> imagine what I look like, can't you? I was 20, 21, something like that. Driving a new, I was about 25, 26, I think. I was driving a BMW, nice BMW. Uh, dressed in all green gear, you know. And he's shouting something to me. And I he said, I thought he says to me, Do you want a pill? I went, Yeah. He said to me, Are you old Bill? <laughs> <laughs> he says, get out, get outside, get outside. And he says to me, You fucking old Bill, said you cheeky bastards. And I thought he said, Do you want a pill? Mm. <laughs> then, yeah, up there. So I would them sort of incidents, you know. Anyway, give me a pill and I went back in. But I'm not condoning these either, the fucking shit they are today, so I'd imagine, but not like the old days. Matsubishi's. Mitsubishi's, Dennis and Menaces, Rhubarb and Custers, you know, one in, you're fucking going all night. I'm really happy, but the restrictions place things on me like that, so that's a good thing. Yeah. Do you miss the old Kev? I miss the old Kev where people take liberties. I won't hurt you, don't tread on my toes, I won't stamp on yours. But if you're taking a liberty and you're treading on my toes, I'm going to have to come and stamp on yours. You don't have to use violence. I mean, taking that fellow away and fighting the life out of him, that tells him what could happen. Or could have happened. But that is a kidnap. Holding someone uh, uh, forcibly. All right? Using force to imprison, false imprisonment. You get nicked for that and you go to prison for it. All right? Whereas I used to see that, it's just a, well, just having a word of him. You go back a few more years and you had the local, you'd go see someone in the local area and they'd sort things out in the area like that, like community sorting out, you know. So you got uh, Colin Gunn and Dave Gunn, best, best, for, best, boy, best be boys in Nottingham. They had to police their estate, no burglaries, all that, no car nicking. They had like a 300 strong firm. Right. I feel that they was able to do stuff for the community that the police couldn't. People could know who else is going to get burgled by a load of fucking skagheads or crackheads. You know, searching for, nicking whatever they can get their hands on for gear. I mean, the police can't protect everybody now. And again, society's getting to the state now. There's some areas where people will go to people in that area who are predominantly well-known, violent men who can take care of themselves to sort the... <clears throat> you might get someone who's a real arsehole. You know, like, you, you get a good idea and someone say, couldn't have happened to a better person. Like, a, a nan would say, you with me? Right, nasty bastard. Well, sometimes <clears throat> these people need to be put in order because they're doing stuff. Inflicting hardships and pains and bullying and such on people in the area. Real nasty people. And they might have done something where it can be sorted out a lot easier. Do you have any regrets, Kev? Loads. Loads of regrets. <clears throat> um, hmm. There's things that I wish uh, I hadn't done in my life. There's things I wish I had done that I didn't. Um, but if you hang on to those regrets in a manner where they eat you away or use those regrets to keep you doing the right that's what I do and hold on to them in the sense where remind yourself because with the pain they've caused you or the pain you've caused someone else I'd rather I hadn't done that or caused that or been party to it or, or been subject to it myself 
And yeah, I hold on to them for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. For anybody that's struggling in life, maybe in prison, what advice would you have for them? In prison? Maybe if they're in prison or just struggling in general. You've got to find yourself, in general, right, it costs nothing to smile, okay? Try and do one thing at a time, one thing a day, and achieve one thing a day. If, so if you're not getting out of bed, then I'm, tomorrow I'm going to make it, I'm going to get out of bed tomorrow. I'm going to go and sit in the front room or sit in the garden if it's a nice day, grab a bit of fresh air for five or ten minutes. Do one thing different that's positive. Whatever it is that you want to do, different to what you're doing. But you have to do that and then build on them positives and keep going forward. What's all your social media links in that, Kev, for people that's maybe what a message you, drop your message, talk about the book, talk about your your stories, like what advice, what's your links? So you got Fitted Up and Fighting Back Instagram, Fitted Up and Fighting Back Facebook, TikTok. If you want to learn how to make some booze, have a look at them. <laughs> all right. Uh, <clears throat> um, Twitter, I don't really use that, but I'm going to start using that because you get some good coverage on that, especially with the Dominic D'Souza podcast, because mm -hmm. that would be, you know, Twitter's probably, I don't know if it's more the legal debate. It's more inclined to have people of that ilk on there, mm -hmm. I think, maybe, I don't know, collectively. Um, so, yeah, fill up and fight him back. Get on there. And the books, I mean, I've sold. But I've got to do another order of books. Books are flying out. Just from my website alone, 685 books last year. Just from my website. So it may not seem like a lot to some people, but we've done as well as people walking sales and such. There's a thousand books gone. That's without Amazon, that's without gardeners, waterstones online. We send thousands of books a year now. And the, like one family, um, that book done for the family. And like you said, I've read it back to back. People sending, there was some messages, sent three out of those 10 the other uh, last month or so. They said, I've just had to pick it up and read it again straight away. And I'm, so I'm really proud of it. Yeah, good on you. Would you like to finish up on anything? Well, I'd like to finish up on, right? Um, sometimes when things are so difficult against you, amongst all odds i mean i've had real car crash this last since christmas and before real car crash uh probably why i look so tired um but there's people far worse off than me my mate robbie islands on the tiktok have a look at that the tiktok pictures of him walking around and being in hospital and shit like that riddled with illnesses and things and i thought i was all done by and i went up to see him and laughing and joking so yeah there's someone worse off than you and just keep going forward and smile yeah. Kev listen always a pleasure mate I wish you all the best for the future thank and no doubt I'll see you in a few months for whatever else we've got planned lovely God thank you very you, much mate. cheers